Good morning and welcome to our panel, a conversation with former President, Her Excellency Atifeti Yayaga on gender-based violence. I am Shah Zakram, Executive Director of the Women's Foreign Policy Group, a network of international affairs professionals dedicated to advancing women's leadership, amplifying their voices through substantive global issues like today's discussion, and preparing the next generation and mid-career professionals for leadership through year-round mentoring and professional development. Women's Foreign Policy Group is pleased to partner with the Council of Women Leader, World Leaders and the United Nations Foundation. We are very grateful for them partnering with us and organizing this very timely panel. I'm also delighted to welcome our panelists, former President, Her Excellency Atifeti Yayaga, and Ambassador, retired Kathleen Dorsey, who is also World, uh, Women's Foreign Policy Group's uh, uh, board of director. I also welcome Patricia Dayton, senior advisor from the United Nations Foundation, who will be introducing the former president of Kosovo. We want to include your questions as well. You can send them in through the Q&A option button at the bottom of your screen at any point during the conversation, and we will include as many as we can. At this time, I would like to turn over to Ambassador Kathleen Doherty. She will give a brief introduction and then hand over to our next introducer of the president. Kathleen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I um, want to thank you everyone for participating. It's a real honor to be able to have this conversation with Madam President Atapete Yayaga. Uh, we were just reminiscing a little bit before we started how many people we know in common. So I feel like I'm already talking to a good friend and I look forward to having a chance to hear um, your thoughts about a very profound and issue that we all will be uh, needing to address. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Patricia and then look forward to starting the conversation. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I am uh, Patricia Deaton and I am actually senior advisor for the Council of Women World Leaders. We are located at the United Nations Foundation, so, uh, but I'm not senior advisor to that organization, which would be a terrific thing to do, but I'm also uh, honored to have been with the Council of Women World Leaders for 20 years and have been ex formerly the executive director and stayed engaged with this quite unique and amazing group of uh, women accomplished at the highest level of state and government. And it is my honor this morning to introduce Her Excellency Atfiti Jajaga, who was president of the Republic of Kosovo from 2011 to 2016. President Jajaga served as the fourth and importantly, the first woman president of the Republic of Kosovo. She was Kosovo's first nonpartisan candidate, the first female head of state in the modern Balkans, and the youngest female world leader to be elected to that highest office. President Jajaga constantly participates in national and international conferences and initiatives aimed at empowering women and supporting the survivors of sexual violence during the war. She continues to be resolute in her fight against violent extremism and radicalization and is a staunch promoter of peace and stability for the Balkans and beyond. During her presidency, she worked diligently to bring women to the forefront of Kosovo's political, economic, and social life as a means of ensuring a long-lasting democracy. In this context, in 2012, she hosted the International Women's Summit called Partnership for Change, Empowering Women, which was attended by 200 leaders from Kosovo, the wider Europe, North America, Africa, and the Middle East. The summit provided a venue for women from the region to cross ethnic barriers and come together to launch and promote a platform for their empowerment as women throughout the Balkans. The discussions led to the creation of the Pristina Principles, which affirm the rights of women to political participation and representation, to economic resources and access to security and justice, and call for the actions to make these principles a reality. These principles were adopted as a resolution by the Kosovo Assembly. 
President Jajaga became a member of the Council of Women World Leaders in 2012, and she is a recipient of numerous honors and awards, including a Doctor Honoris Causa from the University of Durham, the Leadership in Public Service Award from the Clinton Global Initiative, and the Honorary Degree of Doctor of Law from the University of Leicester. In March of 2018, President Jajaga established the Jajaga Foundation that focuses on youth and women empowerment toward achieving social change in Kosovo. Welcome, President Jajaga. We total, really look forward to our discussion with you. And Ambassador, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Shaz. So, Madam President, we have a, a long list of questions, and I'd uh, like to just start um, with the very first one. Gender-based violence increases during every type of emergency, whether economic crises, conflict or disease outbreaks, pre-existing social norms and gender inequalities, economic and social stress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with restrictive movement and social isolation measures have led to an exponential increase in gender-based violence. Many women are on lockdown at home with their abusers or being cut off from normal support services. From your perspective, what are some concrete actions and strategies that need to be undertaken to address and prevent gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19? Uh, well, uh, good morning for you and good afternoon for us. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. And it's really such an honor to be able to share this panel uh, uh, with you. Uh, Patricia, thank you so much for such a uh, kind introduction uh, from your side. I wish we were able to share this panel today to talk more about the uh, success, about the progress on addressing one of the most pressing issue of the today's date on the issue of the gender based uh, uh, violence, but unfortunately, as you say, Ambassador, uh, gender-based violence tends to increase during different types of the emergency. And the COVID-19 pandemic has been viewed so far as one of the most unprecedented emergency of our uh, generation. Uh, the problem, the biggest problem with this uh, global pandemic is that has uh, made us uh, lock inside, stay home, uh, stayed under the continuous measure introduced by many of the countries and many of uh, uh, governments for several weeks, weeks of the lockdown. And it was quite of the burning for all of us uh, uh, to adjust to the situation and the change. And it was much harder and much bigger burning uh, for the uh, vi victims of the gender-based violence because uh, uh, they were uh, sharing, they were staying uh, within the same houses uh, together, locked inside with their abusers, with a no opportunity or very little op opportunity to escape from the violence uh, at all. And if we look into the numbers, uh, there has been a shocking increase of the cases uh, of the gender-based violence uh, since the uh, COVID-19 outbreak in uh, March of 2020. In the time frame of one year, only since the uh, pandemic has been declared as the global uh, pandemic, it has been estimated the number of about 240 million women and girls throughout the world uh, between the group age of the 15 to 49 that they have experienced a sexual or and uh, the physical abuse by their intimate partner and not even thinking and analyzing the psychological uh, effect of it. Uh, however, it was really difficult, especially in the beginning of the 2020, uh, to effectively respond, react, and address the issues of the already increased number of the gender-based violence. First of all, because nobody has expected uh, for this type of the emergency, and we were simply not not ready as the people, as the countries, as the uh, government. From the other side, that the uh, governments, international development agencies, uh, donors, women rights uh, uh, activists, the safe houses, and the first responders, they were not uh, prepared and they did not have in place the strategies and the action plans how to deal with the sudden increase of the numbers of the, uh, the gender-based 
uh, uh, violence. And now two years, almost two years uh, after, we need to be uh, prepared for any future similar uh, uh, crisis. Uh, also crunches across the globe uh, and the governments around the world uh, during this uh, course of the two years uh, of the uh, global pandemic, they responded uh, towards uh, uh, the threats and the challenges posed by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in accordance to their uh, uh, national, uh, subnational, and uh, uh, local plans uh, in place. However, it is of the crucial importance to integrate the gender-based uh, violence within those strategies and within those plans and action plans and the operation uh, plans in order to prevent this kind of phenomena for the near future. Also the governments and uh, countries across the globe, they need and we need to strengthen and expand the gender-based violence services, uh, such as uh, shelters, safe houses, safe spaces, and all the way down to the uh, psychosocial support and advice that should be available uh, to all of the victims and the survivors of the gender-based uh, violence, or to any individuals who might be facing the risk of the being uh, facing with a gender-based violence. Also, it's important that this capacity of such kind of the services uh, to be provided needs to be increased and to be expanded. A good example of this kind of the services that I would like to share with you today, uh, which uh, it will happen with uh, the government of the France uh, during the uh, 2020. And actually, that was initially initiated by the women activists, the women organization, and then supported by the government of France, which made available about 20,000 hotel rooms available to the uh, possible victims of the domestic violence and the gender-based violence to be used as the safe uh, spaces and the safe uh, shelters. Also, it is very fundamental when we talk about this uh, to support the police and judiciary, uh, especially the police, which are most of the time the first responders uh, on, when we are facing with a gender-based uh, violence, uh, because they need to be uh, supported on the developing the necessary plans, uh, of, uh, action plans and the strategies, how to best service the needs of the uh, victims and the survivors of the gender-based violence. Uh, Something that was not very pleasing to see uh, uh, this past uh, two years, it was the uh, the blockage that we have seen, particularly within judicial system, that the cases of the gender-based violence have been waiting for the weeks and the months uh, uh, without the hearing, within the prosecution and within the uh, judiciary, because the countries has imposed, for the known reasons, uh, the lockdowns for a couple of weeks. And this delay on the access to the justice for the gender based violence uh, victims is in a way has uh, 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 prevented the victims from one of the basic rights to them, which is the access to the justice and the rights to have the access and the justice. And the last but not the least is that uh, uh, there it is a very crucial for the uh, government and uh, governments and particularly for the international organization to allocate the larger budget when we speak about the institutions dealings with the gender based violence or at least not to shrink the existing budget because usually uh, the governments have shown that they have the tendency of shrinking the budget, especially when it meant to deal with the women and particularly dealing with the issues of the gender-based violence because the finances and the human resources are uh, very fundamental when we speak about addressing properly the gender-based violence. Well, thank you, Madam President. Uh, that was a, a very thoughtful and comprehensive uh, answer. I'd like to drill down a little bit further to some of the points that you made. We know that involving women in the decision-making process will not only address the immediate needs and issues of women who have suffered from gender-based violence, but will also create long-term reforms to achieving gender equality. How do we ensure that women are included in the planning, implementation, and evaluation of any decision or policy related to gender-based violence? Well, um, Ambassador, this is, um, I usually refer something like a million dollar question, and uh, uh, actually this is a very important question that uh, we as the uh, policy and decision makers, we should ask ourselves and ask our teams. 
how do we ensure the inclusion of women in all phases of processes, not only dealing with the issues of the gender-based violence, uh, uh, but also dealing with the issues of the concerning the humanity in, uh, in general. Um, Telling you the truth, I find it quite ironic and quite disturbing when in tables of the uh, discussion when the women issues are brought up uh, are usually uh, the men's, the ones who decide what the women uh, experience is and how uh, our issue should be uh, dealt with. And this really has to stop and we really need to change uh, the uh, situation that we are facing at the moment. Uh, because when it comes to the gender-based violence, it's the women that one are the ones that are suffering the most consequences. The women are the ones which are the, making the biggest percentage of the, uh, the victims and the survivors of the gender-based violence. And if we just go back one more time to the study about 61% of the women uh, that uh, have reported once in their life that they have been experiencing one type of the violence. And about 45% of the women, they have declared for themselves and a woman that they might, uh, that they know that they have been experiencing a type of the violence uh, during this time of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And the situation is even much harder and much more difficult when we speak about the women and girls belonging to the marginalized groups, uh, like the uh, minority communities of the different religious communities, uh, women of disabilities. Uh, these categories, uh, uh, my friends, is uh, four times more likely to experience uh, gender-based violence uh, compared with the other groups of the uh, women. And so based into my uh, personal and professional uh, 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 encountering with so many of the uh, survivors of the gender-based uh, violence. Uh, the gender-based violence is not uh, a technical issue that we say to ourselves that we fix into the system and we are up and running. Uh, no, we need to include the women, particularly on that what we you raised in the beginning, from the very beginning, starting from collecting the data and collecting the statistics. And the best way is to involve themselves, the victims, and to involve themselves, the survivors, uh, by collecting the data, by collecting the statistic by making them a part or individually directly with the survivors or through uh, the uh, uh, organization through the uh, women organization and women uh, activists into the process of the uh, planning uh, of the action plans of the strategies and the uh, operation plans and um, ensuring how to include women in all parts of the processes uh, is uh, an issue to which uh, we have yet to find an answer for. Uh, uh, we talk about it publicly, uh, we embrace the idea, we definitely talk about that, we lobby for more inclusive uh, policies. Uh, but something that we as Kosovo have introduced over two decades ago and that we have seen as one of the very good mechanism to make sure the women representation is that uh, over uh, almost 20 years ago, we have introduced the quota uh, for the women representation across the, bro uh, uh, across the board, including the 30% of the women into the parliament, into the government, into the central level, into the uh, local level, into the private sector, into the corporate uh, boards. And so we have been uh, facing with a lot of uh, the uh, ups and downs and many of the uh, positive or the negative uh, comments on this. But I would say from my own experience and the expertise, uh, quota is is one of the best tools which will move us from the situation or the position where we are to the ideal uh, 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 position that we really want to be. Also, the quota can be applied particularly to the topic that we are talking today about, uh, about a proper representation of the women belonging to the marginalized uh, groups that we I mentioned earlier from the different ethnic communities, from the different religious communities, and with the disabilities. To make them a part from the very beginning by including the quota for their representation into the planning, into the evaluation, and into the process of the uh, implementation. So, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, Madam President, I actually share your frustration when I was ambassador to Cyprus. I was really struck by the very few numbers of women who were at the negotiating table and how marginalized women's voices were during the negotiations and, and how their perspectives on security and safety were very different than men in Cyprus, and yet their voices were not heard as well. So, 
I did my best to try to um, support those voices, and I know we continue to do so, but I was really struck by how, how, how silent they were, not how silent they were, but how silent they were. So, um, yeah, it's a very sobering picture, but I really appreciate your efforts. Um, I, to go down a little bit further, um, I know uh, Patricia mentioned your role, uh, you hosted the International Women's Summit um, on Empowering Women. But I also want to talk a little bit about your experience and how you mobilized public opinion in support of the socially stigmatized survivors of sexual violence in Kosovo, and how you included Kosovo in global initiatives on the prevention of sexual violence as a tool of war, and how you helped create and establish the necessary legal infrastructure for survivors in order to guarantee their, their rights. And what lessons from the post-war context of Kosovo can we draw to address uh, gender-based violence during COVID? Yeah. Um, Ambassador, thank you very much. And um, uh, yes, uh, the lessons learned, uh, and Patricia has mentioned that back in 2012, we have organized for the first time the uh, summit of uh, uh, women that has brought together over 200 leaders from uh, women leaders from around the world. And telling you the truth, it was not an easy task to bring so many of the women leaders at the one place at the same uh, time. And some of the lessons learned that we have uh, taken during uh, uh, the uh, cases of the Kosovo that has gone that can be used uh, not only with this emergency of the COVID-19 that we are facing, but or for any future goal, global emergencies. I would be di dividing that in three parts. As first is that, that what is damaged has to be uh, restored. Uh, Ambassador and dear friends uh, out there, uh, 22 years ago, we have inherited a country which has been totally uh, destroyed, which has not only from the infrastructure point of view, but mainly from the human point of view. It left behind over 13,000 people who has been killed and massacred. Still, till today's date, we are uh, th th uh, having over 1,600 people missing in different massive graves within the territory of of Kosovo and the territory of Serbia, with the continuous uh, uh, request and the uh, and the demand from the institutions of Kosovo, from the family members and the human rights activists, uh, to know where the remains of the their loved ones are. At the same time, facing with a denial from our northern neighbor of Serbia, to cooperate with the institutions of Kosovo or the international community, to share with the data and the statistics of the mass graves where the remains of our loved ones are. Also 22 years ago, we have inherited a country which has left behind an estimated number of 20,000 women and men which have been raped during the war time. Ambassador, when I speak about the survivors of the sexual violence, it's uh, the moment that I become over emotional uh, because I personally have met hundreds and hundreds of the survivors of the sexual violence throughout the country. I met a mother that she was in her early 40s, that she was raped together with her three daughters. Her oldest daughter was 15 years old. The middle daughter was 13 years old. And the youngest one was as young as seven years old with a Down syndrome. I met a woman that her dreams of becoming a mother were forever shattered because of the consequences of the rape. I met a mother that she was six months pregnant, that she miscarried the child because of the rape. And while she was facing with this inhuman act of the rape, she witnessed also the killing of her husband and the other family uh, members. And on and on and on that I have so many of the stories and suffering of those women that they have gone through that I have mentioned so many times publicly that I want to mention again here today that they have been and they continue to be still an open wound of our society but still at the same time the biggest pride of our uh, society because we have gained so many battlefields there but their bodies were turned into the battlefield until very last, last moment, we did not recognize that uh, towards the survivors of the sexual violence. 
although the justice has not been served and has not been delivered, Ambassador, to the ones who has lost their loved ones, to the ones who have been beaten brutally, and to the ones who have been raped during the wartime, we have managed to turn that existential threat into the opportunity for creating a better future for our country and our citizens. And in this spirit, uh, I think we, uh, when it comes to the gender-based uh, violence, we need and we must address all of the damages that has been caused uh, to all of the victims of these horrendous uh, crimes. And we must seek ways to prevent gender-based violence to happening and occurring in the near future, particularly into the uh, war and into the uh, uh, conflict uh, environment. And as I said earlier, that we will never be able to find our peace before we will find the peace, but before they will find the peace. So a second is that health will come only if you ask for it. Why say that? Because the end of the war in Kosovo was only made possible uh, following the intervention of the uh, NATO, which has helped to dismantle uh, the uh, police, military, and the paramilitary structure of the uh, Milosevic regime in uh, Serbia. The Kosovo Liberation Army, a guerrilla force, fought against the repression and the ethnic cleansing that was taking place uh, uh, towards the innocent Kosovo uh, Albanians. But without our international uh, partners and allies, we would not be able uh, to stop the aggression that we have been saving. It was up to the uh, leadership of Kosovo, that times the leadership elite the, uh, and the Kosovo institution in general that have reached out to the Western country, to the United States of America and the key countries within the European Union that has sent the message about the mass killing, about the rape and about the genocide and the ethnic cleansing that was taking place in Kosovo. And so when we take this in context of the gender-based violence, it's not only the victims who need to have, ask the help and support Support. It is also the first responders who need to reach out and yes, the necessary uh, uh, help and the support in order to bestly uh, service the needs of the uh, survivors and the victims of the gender-based violence. Because I know so many of the organizations uh, around the world and including here in Kosovo, uh, that they are trying their best to, to offer the best services with a very limited uh, resources. At the same time, I know so many individuals and so many uh, organizations, they want to help, but they don't know how to do that. So I think that it's or they, uh, the organization should do more uh, into pre uh, proactive, to be more proactive in seeking more help, how to offer the services to the uh, victims of the gender-based violence. And the third and the last one is that the uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, this means that uh, there is always somebody out there and a country and a government, an individual that has gone the, through the same problem and the, through the same challenges that you are going through, that they find that the ways, uh, how to uh, fully recover from that. And it's up to us to reach out to them to be able to gain that help and support. And especially when we speak on the gender-based uh, violence, it is uh, that networking is one of the crucial elements uh, uh, to be effective in the fight on the, being effective in the fight against the gender-based violence. And I mean, honestly, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to share our best experience and expertise. What we have seen for this almost two years, that the countries and the governments facing with such a flux of the increased number of the gender-based violence, they use different approaches, different strategies, different methodologies. We just need to put it out there and make it available to everyone that needs that and share it because the, the international and the regional cooperation is very crucial to be effective. Well, thank you. And I think it's, it's so important what you're doing is telling the stories of people and the lives lost and lives destroyed, but also what we can, so those lives have meaning, um, and speaking of have meaning and how we can have use their stories, their tragic stories to create a better world and better accountability. I know you touched a bit about on, on social services and international organizations and what um, they can do. 
I'm curious about your views on how we can harness technology to ensure that women and girls have access to not only mental health services, but virtual platforms for information, um, for some use of accountability, because especially in a COVID world where we're obviously on Zoom right now, um, where technology is, is actually a fundamental part of our lives right now. How, how do you foresee going forward using, um, there are, that is a new thing under the sun, is able to use technology. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Ambassador, the uh, use of technology and the social media platform uh, can definitely be used, as you mentioned, uh, and that can help on educating uh, young girls and young women how they could and how they can react when whenever they are in a hazard situation or when they are in danger. At the same time, this kind of the platform can be a very useful tool uh, also for the first responder, how to react in time uh, on the certain <clears throat> cases uh, and uh, the smartphone apps, the messages, the uh, social media uh, and other online uh, platforms are very useful to not only to uh, use them to educate the young women and uh, girls and all other possible uh, victims uh, of the gender-based uh, violence, not only to support the first responders uh, to react in time, but they are also a very good tool uh, that can collect, collect the necessary information that can can collect evidences that can be in the near future be used uh, as the evidence for the prosecution of the cases. Uh, and when I'm in here, I would like to use a couple of the uh, cases, an example that really impressed me uh, the way how efficient that has shown to be. Uh, for example, the platform TikTok, which is very much used by the uh, teenagers, uh, that it has helped the uh, police in Kentucky to rescue uh, one uh, young girl, a teenager, teenager uh, of the 16 years old that she was resulting uh, missing that she used her that the popular sign of the hand in the TikTok, which has alerted the police to go out and to rescue her. Another good example that I, it really impressed me was that was widely used in United Kingdom. It's called uh, uh, Bright Sky uh, that has helped the survivors of the uh, possible survivors of the gender-based violence, how they can save avoid or escape from the toxic environment and from the abusive situation at the same time has helped to store the data and the statistics not necessarily saving them into the smartphone which in a way can be directly uh, uh, threatening the uh, the victims or the survivors of the gender-based violence that could be later used as the evidence for the court and for the prosecution of the cases another good example is in a totally different continent in uh, Australia called the uh, uh, Safety Net uh, Australia, which has made available a smartphone and the $30 of the credit for all of the possible uh, victims of the gender-based uh, violence to be used. So they can use it to call the assistance, to call the support, and uh, to alert about the danger and the risk that they are uh, facing. So uh, Ambassador, while we have one side uh, uh, for the countries and the societies and the governments that they have a quite high percentage of the use of the internet, use of the technology uh, and other platform in order to successfully tackle the gender-based violence. Uh, but it's another side that we have to, uh, to look into that, uh, especially when, when it comes to the countries and the societies and the communities, which they have a very low percentage of the use of the internet, very low percentage on the uh, access to the uh, smartphones and towards this, uh, uh, the online uh, platforms. So here is something that we need to think about the ways and the strategies and the tools, uh, how to address the gender-based violence within uh, those sites. So we have uh, both the strings that we needed, really need to provide the proper services for both of them. I agree with you on the, if just uh, availability is key. And we need to be able to help support the availability of, of digital based platforms. Yeah. Shifting gears for a moment, and um, I'd like to talk to you about as, as a leader who happens to be a woman. A woman. I know when I was ambassador to Cyprus, I was the first female ambassador in the United States, but I never like to identify myself as a female ambassador. I happen to be an ambassador who also is a female. And uh, I think that sometimes when we 
qualify ourselves as a female something, it, it makes us different. But I think it's more important to say you were a president, I was an ambassador, and we also happen to be women. Um, you broke a barrier going into the police, and you broke a barrier again becoming the first president who was a woman in a very male-dominated society. What would be your advice to women following you and wanting to have the same type of impact and, and groundbreaking uh, uh, motivation? Oh, well, Ambassador, um, thank you so much. And uh, every time I'm posed with this question, um, I don't know where to start and where to end with that, because there are books and books that can be written about the experience and the, what I have gone through, uh, especially in the first years. I would start by simply passing a very first message, especially to the young women and with the women leaders out there that uh, go out and break the barriers because you never know how the results will be before you try it and before you take that step. Um, living through my entire life in a very patriarchal society, uh, not like it's the case of the Kosovo, but the entire region of the southeastern part of the uh, Europe and many countries around the world where dominates that idea that uh, men are there to lead and the women uh, to follow. Women need to be strong. They need to be courageous. They need to be determined in order to achieve their goals. There will always be critics, no matter what you do. But my dear friend, Ambassador, status quo does not favor to anyone. And we need to challenge the status quo. And we, before challenging the status quo, we will never be able to see the positive changes that are about uh, to happen. There will always be people who, were, uh, who are not satisfied with your work, who will criticize of everything, what you do on every decision that you take. And even if they're not able to criticize you about your work and about your decision, they will be criticizing the way that you look, the way that you dress, the way that you have your hair today uh, 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 set up, uh, the way that you talk, the way that you uh, uh, walk. And I would just simply say that ignore all this kind of the criticism and please only focus and accept this type of the criticism, which are going to help you to improve and to get you better uh, in the future. Another take out, uh, take out that uh, I have uh, experienced throughout my uh, service into this public service in the rule of law and the presidency is that we need to go out and we need to talk to the people and we need to listen to the people uh, more. Get out of there and get your own views about the uh, real problems and the struggles that people face in the daily basis. Trust me, it's going to make your process of the decision making, maybe in the beginning much harder because you have so many sides of it to listen to that. But at the end of the day, it's going to make you take the right decision at the end. The other take out and the advice is that uh, please do extend that table of the decision-making and add more chairs to the, all of the ones that has been left outside for the far too long. And we talked in the very beginning about that. Add chairs for the women, for young people, and for the marginalized groups, because it's again going to help your process of the decision-making. And the last but not the least is that lead with your knowledge, but also please do lead with your heart. That's great. Uh, not only do we need to have the chairs in the room, but we need to have women sit in their chairs. I often found when I was leading discussions that women would sometimes put themselves in the back of the room rather than putting them to, seeing themselves at the table. So those of us who are, who are in positions of leadership need to make sure that people step up, women step up and, uh, and sit at the table. We received a couple of questions from uh, our participants and I, uh, I'm gonna combine two of them. They're not necessarily connected, but in the interest of time. Um, so you have a chance to answer as many questions. So the first question is, can virtual platforms be effective in reaching women 
who identify as disabled, who might have difficulty in access, accessing forms of representation. And then the second question is, how can we dismantle the stigma surrounding sexual and gender-based violence? Was this an issue you had to confront when working with survivors in Kosovo? What are the best practices for encouraging women to come forth with testimonies? And how do we best protect them from social discrimination? Yeah. Um, Ambassador, I will answer the, for, uh, the second question while the second one I did not hear properly. Uh, well, when we speak about uh, the uh, stigma which uh, surrounds the, uh, the survivors of the uh, gender-based violence, but particularly the, uh, the survivors of the sexual violence uh, during the uh, war, I personally had to deal with this for many years uh, in the role. And uh, when I started for the first time to talk about the issue of the, of the uh, sexual violence used as a tool of war in Kosovo, uh, tell you the truth, uh, Ambassador, uh, I had many of the advices from uh, my male colleagues that time that the uh, people are not ready, Madam President, to talk about this because our social norm and our uh, mentality does not allow to talk about the issue of the rape uh, during uh, the war time. So that chapter mm -hmm. has been closed immediately after the end of the war, and we should not reopen uh, that again. So it took uh, one of the very first meetings that I had in my office uh, with uh, over 35 women uh, from one part of Kosovo that they have been raped uh, during the war time, uh, that I made one of the top priorities within my presidency, the issue of the uh, survivors of the sexual uh, uh, violence. Uh, because the people simply did not want to talk about that. The institutions, they had no institutional initiatives while uh, we taking care about all other groups coming out of the war, like the martyrs, the veterans of the war, the survivors of the sexual violence, they were just keep into the silence. It was kept as a taboo topic within our society. So in a, in a way, we have covered the survivors of the sexual violence with a veil of shame uh, by pointing the fingers unjustly toward the survivors of the gender of the uh, sexual violence during the wartime uh, towards them that it's your fault that you ask for it that what has happened to you instead of pointing the fingers towards the perpetrators of this horrendous uh, uh, crime and so it took me three years believing or not uh, ambassador to analyze thoroughly my constitutional uh, powers and uh, uh, legal uh, powers as the president because Kosovo is the parliamentary democracy where the most of the executive power falls under the government, uh, which is the prime minister and the rest of the government. Legislative falls into the parliament while only the foreign policy and the national security and limited powers into the judiciary fall into the parliament, uh, into the president. And so I simply had to uh, look very carefully because they were hardly waiting that time to send me to the constitutional court and to discharge me for the position for the violation of the constitution. And so that's why I had to walk through in a very thin line uh, in order to empower me uh, constitutionally and legally to give me the right to deal actively and executively on the issues of the, of the gender-based violence, but particularly on with the uh, survivors of the sexual violence during the war time. And it was back in 2000 2014 that I launched uh, the uh, National Council for the Survivors of the Sexual uh, Violence, which has dealt, which has uh, had main, four main uh, issues on their rehabilitation, reintegration, resocialization, access into the health services, and access to, to the uh, justice. At the same time, dealing with a stigma, uh, because uh, no matter what the institutions were doing, no matter what the president is uh, speaking outside, we were still having the uh, hesitation among the uh, general public to talk about public about what has happened to the women and girls of uh, Kosovo. 
and not even speaking about the stigma uh, that was dominated among the survivors because only few of them in the very beginning, uh, they could speak and they could come up publicly and say what has happened to them uh, before the war time, during the res civilian resistance, during the war time uh, and uh, uh, after uh, the war time. And so I have tackled these issues from the many fronts. From one side, by amending the law uh, for the uh, war values and granting the legal rights to the, all of the victims of the uh, sexual violence during the wartime, recognizing their, their status as the civilian uh, victims uh, of the war, which was a very big step uh, forward, which has made the victims of the sexual violence that they are not alone in this world, that they are the institutions that, that, one that are speaking on uh, their behalf. At the same time, then I reached out to many of the artists in Kosovo, because that time I had really difficulties uh, to find the language or the, the message that is going to come to the cross to the people in general, but not only in Kosovo, but mainly in at the international uh, stage as well. That that time I organized uh, the event, which was called Thinking of You, which was an art installation, which put uh, about 5,000 skirts collected by the survivors themselves, by the many of the women activists, uh, by the uh, members of the institutions of Kosovo, hanging them in the, uh, the state football stadium of uh, Kosovo by sending that message that it's not their shame what has happened to them. The shame is of those perpetrators who has done these uh, horrendous uh, crimes. And so that was the breaking point of the the, uh, the tackling the stigma which surrounded the survivors of the uh, sexual uh, violence by putting the law in place, by putting the mechanism for their rehabilitation, reintegration, and resocialization, and access to the medical uh, services. And then giving the opportunity to many of the uh, women NGOs who immediately after the end of the war, they were the only open uh, opportunity or the, or the open gate for the survivors of the sexual violence to go and seek the assistance and starting from the medical and gynecological uh, treatment and all the way down to the psychological uh, treatment for them and certifying them at the state uh, by the uh, state institutions uh, to be able to receive the application form for the survivors and to grant their legal status as the civilian victims of the war. So it took us about five years uh, for uh, the stigma to be broken but uh, in the general public. But now well, when you come to the cause of everybody knows what has happened to the women of Kosovo and everybody embraces and supports uh, the sacrifice that the women of Kosovo uh, has gone through. There is so much of the expertise that Kosovo has gained during these past 10 years of actively dealing with the survivors of the sexual uh, violence. And going back to this point that we uh, mentioned and the earlier to be able to share that experience and to share that uh, expertise because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Kosovo is available out there to many countries around the world to offer our experience and to offer our expertise because we were really facing a hard time uh, when we started that process back in 2011, in 2012. The only expertise which was made to us available that time was from Bosnia and Herzegovina or from the Rwanda. And so, which was very useful to that time. And now uh, we have our own example that we want to spread to the other countries and to make it available to them. That's great, and the leadership is really important. As we talked about, and you, you mentioned that sexual and gender-based violence is often used as a weapon in conflict. What steps, this is a question from one of our members of participants, what steps must political and military leaders take to enforce a culture of zero tolerance for sexual violence? And do you think that the laws of conflict as they stand are sufficient in preventing and prosecuting wartime sexual violence? Well, um, telling the truth, um, uh, if we look into the many of the international conventions, if we take into the men, in many of the uh, international law, and if we look into the way how they are uh, being implemented and how they are being uh, used, uh, 
I think there is so much of the uh, vacuum and the space uh, to improve, starting from the very beginning, uh, how the, uh, the, our uh, men and women soldiers and the police officers are being uh, trained uh, in, initially and how sensitive they are uh, when we speak about uh, the uh, gender-based uh, violence. Uh, we are still talking about uh, the, and actually we just uh, inaugurated over 20, 21 years since the adoption of 1325 resolution uh, for the women, peace and uh, security. And uh, Ambassador, what is it continuously disturbing me there that now we are seeing the consequences and more and more of that is that these convention are not a legally binding documents. And it has been put out there that is up to the goodwill of the countries or the governments to adopt them or not not to adopt them, to apply accordance to them or not to apply in accordance to them. Kosovo's case is one of the best cases in the, not only in this region of the Western Balkan, but the entire re wider region of the Southeastern part of the Europe, that we have taken all of this obligation from the international law and international convention, and we uh, translated them within our constitution and within uh, our laws. But this does not necessarily mean that this happened with so many other countries yeah. and especially I want to raise another very concerning uh, element is when we have the issue of the uh, peacekeeping uh, uh, mission and especially when the uh, police officers and the soldiers go into the uh, war zone or the post-war zone or the post-conflict that they are in a very minimum being trained and educated uh, especially in the environment that they are coming in or stepping in. I just take again the example of Kosovo 22 years ago, when the, the UN mission started in Kosovo or the K4 mission has started in Kosovo, they had less than 1.5% of the women representation within their uh, forces. And so, and at the same time coming and embarking in the country, uh, which had an estimated number of 20,000 women and men that have been raped uh, during the uh, wartime. And so no surprises why many of the cases built up since the end of the war uh, in Kosovo in the concept of the war crime cases, they took out the element of the, uh, the, of the rape that has been used as a tool of war. So these are the elements that we are uh, more and more becoming in handicap and are not improving ourselves. And yes, there is so much of the gap that we needed to enforce the countries uh, to obey to the certain international law and the international uh, convention and find the ways how to make them much more legally binding and not only to leave it into the options of the country to you to adopt it or not to adopt it i know and i know the united nations itself has had some uh, cases of its own troops um, engaging in sexual violence and they have done they're starting to look at that in terms of u.n peacekeeping missions and how to ensure that there's a zero tolerance for that and also some of the more successful u.n peacekeeping missions have been ones that have had a lot more women as peacekeepers probably because of the ability to work with uh, victims of sexual violence, but also just in terms of their general effectiveness. I know that it occurred in Liberia. Um, I do know, I agree with also the Women uh, Peace and Security Act. I know US was one of the first countries to actually pass a law. And I think that is one of the things that um, uh, it should be a major priority for, for all international leaders to, to get that codified into domestic law as a very first start. As you said, there's much, so much more to do. Well, I know we're just about um, out of time, and I know we, uh, I know um, I have been thoroughly uh, moved and impressed by uh, your commitment to bringing light to these issues, for your passion for talking about this, for your courage to talk about this, to bring to different forms this uh, acknowledgement of this issue, and, and your continued leadership. Um, it has been truly a, a pleasure and an honor to be on the panel with you. And I, I, I know, I hope the people listening feel as passionate and energized and committed to, to changing things. Um, and I hope I can support your efforts in whatever way possible. Yeah. And I want to just thank you for your, and I know if you have any final comments or remarks, and then I'll. Yeah. 
Well, Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the uh, Council for extending the invitation. Thank you to the for, uh, One Foreign Affairs uh, Policy Group. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, for me uh, to be able uh, to share a little bit of my experience, a little bit of my uh, expertise. And uh, uh, the only way that uh, we can be able to help each other, to support each other, is by sharing uh, our experience and sharing our expertise. Uh, I usually say uh, that uh, uh, sometimes it's at least necessary at least to tell you what not to do. And that is even a good advice because you can use that time uh, to concentrate on the things that can work out and can function in that regard. So Ambassador, it was really a pleasure to be able to share uh, this panel with you today, uh, to share a little bit of the very painful history uh, of uh, our country, of the women of uh, Kosovo, that uh, I said, I think, in the very beginning that uh, they are our biggest pain, but at the same time, they are our biggest uh, pride, especially when we speak about the survivors of the sexual uh, violence. And uh, a promise that I made to them for the first time that I have met them is that uh, uh, initially they did not have the voice, uh, but I promised to them that their voice, that we will be their voice, we will be their mouth, and we will be their ears. Uh, and uh, this kind of the platform was also the way of passing the message and the demand of uh, so many of the thousands of women of Kosovo and men who uh, the rape has been used as a tool of war unjustly towards their bodies. So it was really a pleasure to share with you this uh, today. And I look very much forward to cooperating with you in the near future. Well, I think you've got many more voices now behind you. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Shaz for the final comments. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, on behalf of Women's Foreign Policy Group, I thank all our panelists for joining us today. Thank you, President Atifeti Yayaga and Ambassador Kathleen Doherty for joining us. President Yayaga, your career and work serves as an inspiration to many women around the world. Ambassador Doherty, your distinguished diplomatic and international career serving as U.S. Ambassador to Cyprus as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs and in leadership positions in Rome, London, Moscow, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic continue to inspire our community of women, and you continue to serve as a role model for women in foreign policy group. I would also like to thank Patricia Dayton and the Council for Women Leaders for partnering with us. Also like to thank the United Nations Foundation and thank you most importantly to our audience for joining us and for your excellent questions. A recording of this session will be available to all our attendees and will also be uploaded to WFBG's YouTube channel. We hope that you'll stay connected, join us as a member if you're already not a member, and consider signing up to be a virtual mentor to help support us in our mission to prepare the next generation of women and mid-career professionals for leadership. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>